The uh, police chief of the Minneapolis Police Department has announced changes that are taking place in that department in the wake of uh, the uh, death of George Floyd in 2020. Uh, the department's going to be split into two bureaus. One bureau will be responsible for overseeing police operations and focusing on crime prevention, while the other will focus on rebuilding community trust. In addition to this restructuring, uh, the police department will initiate listening sessions as required by the Minnesota Department of Human Rights Agreement to give community members a platform to share their concerns. Each bureau will have its own assistant chief. A position O'Hara plans to fill from within the department to endure a smooth transition. Um, keep in mind, it, it, it was the federal government, the DOJ, um, coming to a patterns and practices investigation that really um, uh, brought the teeth, if you will, um, Matt, to Minneapolis. Uh, the state had one as well. Uh, and so, well, people need to understand why these investigations matter. They may say all oh, too little too late, but the reality is it allows for them to come in and take a very clear, hard, stern look at the operations and be unflinching in their analysis in terms of how to fix it. And this, I think, this announcement here is really the end result of that. There to be some trust placed in the process by the citizens because there's monitoring through that process. What I thought was actually surprising about this, though, is that Minneapolis, Minneapolis is a large enough city that I would anticipate they would already have such bureaus. So that was kind of surprising to me that they don't already have an assistant chief kind of layer. I mean, even where I live, which is a fraction of the size of that city, has multiple assistant chiefs. But what I was thinking is that I'm hoping that this also does not backfire insofar as it makes it harder to hold the chief accountable for policies in his or her um, uh, department, because when you have other layers, right, you now you have people who are intermediaries in between who are potentially reviewing some of the behavioral issues that they're finding from officers and some of the complaints. And uh, I think it may be good for efficiency, but I think there's a potential that it allows the top brass to kind of separate themselves further from the rank and file. And that could be problematic in terms of ensuring compliance. So. I understand why this change would be made, but I hope that it does not uh, culminate in their being able to kind of sweep more under the rug. Hopefully, it actually will bring more out through the efficiency of the uh, department. Kelly, what has to happen is, I mean, we've got to stay vigilant in demanding uh, these changes be implemented uh, in these departments. Absolutely. Um, you absolutely have to hold people accountable. And um, my my concern, I echo Matt's concern in, in that when you have more layers, you have more buffer room regarding um, shifting the blame and um, the lack of accountability. So that is a concern of mine. And I was also um, wondering why they had to be internal hires when um, typically when you have chief of police, you you kind of outsource that. They're not always from within the department. In fact, they're usually from other jurisdictions altogether. So I thought that maybe an assistant chief would have that same type of model. But nevertheless, uh, like you said, uh, you definitely need accountability in these in these situations. And they do talk about how they're going to have community listening sessions and and hopefully they will take the community's uh, feedback to heart. Uh, but as as far as me trusting this process, I will believe it when I see it. Michael. Uh, you know, reading this article here from uh, care11.com and also taking into account that there's a nationwide shortage of police officers all across the country, um, if this works, this could become a model that is adopted by uh, uh, major cities across the country because they're looking at splitting the Minneapolis Police Department into two departments, and one department would oversee efforts to rebuild community trust. So this is the this is the first time I've heard of an initiative on this level. I've heard of other initiatives to rebuild trust, but to, to split the department into two departments and have one department dedicated to rebuilding trust. Uh, and at the same time, I think uh, across the country, not just in Minneapolis, but across the country, there's a tremendous opportunity 
for many African Americans who want to be the type of officers we say we want to see to apply to these vacant positions, right? And and gain power within these police departments and bring about the change we want to see as well. So this could be something. This could be something big. Um, it has. It, we have to have strong follow through on this. But this could be the beginning of really something big. Well, absolutely. All right, folks. Uh, Kelly, Matt, Michael, we surely appreciate you joining us today uh, on the show. Thank you so very much, folks. Hotep, everybody. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. Wanted to do a brief overview of my 12-week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Join me live in class Saturday, July 29th, 2023, 2 p.m., to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at our online school for another exciting, informative session of my 12-week online course. You see me on Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, talking about this class. You see me on Faraji Muhammad's show, The Culture. Uh, you see me on the Tammy Mac Lake show, uh, as well on the Fox Soul TV network. And this is a 12 week online course we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So you never look at history uh, the same way again. So in this 12 week online course that I developed and I put together the slideshow, the curriculum, I chose the content. Uh, we can't start studying our history in slavery. OK, even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study. We can't start in 1619, and there's a whole lot of talk about 1619 uh, because of the 1619 project and, and the 400th year anniversary of August 20th, 1619, which we do deal with in the class, but we deal with thousands of years of history that leads up to 1619 as well. We can't start in 1619 um, in, in Virginia or in the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved in the transatlantic slave trade. We have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, who take the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa um, into the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal, in 711 AD. And it's going to be these teachings that are going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. OK, they bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. This course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but deals with thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Now, August 26, uh, 2019 marked the 400th year anniversary of those 20 and odd Africans or 20 and odd Negroes who came into Point Comfort which was really in Hampton, Virginia, as opposed to Jamestown, Virginia, on August 20th, 1619, on the White Lion pirate ship. And we go in depth and talk about what happened and deal with the fact that you had 350 Africans who were taken from uh, Angola and, uh, on the, and they were on a slave ship called the San Juan Batista. And the San Juan Batista gets hijacked around Veracruz, Mexico, by two English pirate ships, two English pirate ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer. OK, um, and it's going to be the White Lion and the Treasurer. They come into uh, uh, Virginia in uh, August of 1619. And those 29 Africans are going to be on the White Lion pirate ship, L-I-O-N, which was an English pirate ship. Um, so the uh, August 20, 1619 marked the 400th year anniversary. Uh, of those 20 and odd Africans who came into Point Comfort on August 20, 1619, in what would later become uh, the, the colony of Virginia. Now, this was known as the year of return, as many African Americans were and continued to reconnect to Africa and travel to uh, Ghana or uh, other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central, and South America and have been in the land that we call the United States of America, or some call Turtle Island, at least 51,700 years. And we use uh, numerous sources uh, in this class. Uh, we look at a timeline of history, uh, the book references, there are uh, 82, 100 articles that we look at 
as well. We have video clips, uh, PowerPoint presentation, etc.